Welcome back, everyone. We will now have five different companies, which are a mix of startups and established companies from both Singapore and Norway to share with us different solutions or case studies that are related to digital and communication technologies. And they are also bringing new innovations to the maritime industry. During the presentations, again, if you have any questions, please drop them into the Q&A function. I would like to start with F Drones. F Drones is a Singapore-based startup company and their vision is a world where maritime logistics is more efficient and sustainable. F Drone develops and operates proprietary aerial delivery drones, which can ultimately deliver 100 kilogram loads over 100 kilometers to ships and offshore platforms. Here to present is Mr. Nicholas Ang, co-founder and CEO of F Drones. Nicholas, please. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just uh, bring up my slide for a while. Okay, cool. So I think uh, you guys should be able to see my slides now. So um, I'm Nicholas, the co-founder and CEO of um, F Drones. Um, like Daniel shared, we are based in Singapore with a vision very much to make the world's maritime deliveries uh, more efficient and sustainable. We are the first company to have commenced commercial drone deliveries here. And in November last year, we became the first company in the world to complete a commercial night drone delivery. So at that point in time, we helped deliver a critical spare part for Williamson to Berge Starstein. Uh, that's a vessel owned by Berge that was anchored about five kilometers from shore. And that delivery was just completed in under seven minutes. The payload itself was another significant milestone, being the world's first uh, 3D printed CE certified uh, lifting tool for Wurzela at that point in time. The problem which we are solving with drone deliveries is that every year, um, launch boats, supply vessels, and helicopters make more than two and a half million trips to deliver supplies to ships anchored within ports and also to offshore oil rigs uh, every single year. And this number is actually going to continue to grow with the growth of more offshore assets, such as in offshore wind turbines. In addition, ports are also growing to become uh, more congested as global seaborne trade continues to grow. And this is uh, just a snapshot of the situation in Ningbo. And if we look at marine traffic, most of the world's busiest ports actually look pretty much like this. And we certainly therefore need a more efficient way to move people and cargo within ports, not just uh, within the shore, is shore side, but also within the anchor regions as well. And what we found out also is that the traditional means of sending ice to ships and offshore platforms are pretty pollutive, adding more than 100 million tons of CO2 every single year. So if we take a closer look, uh, an average launch actually produces more than six kilos of CO2 every kilometer it travels. And a helicopter, which usually flies a lot further, produces three and a half kilograms of CO2 every kilometer they fly. They are also pretty expensive and not the most time efficient. So if we were to just, you know, take an example, a delivery by boat to a ship that's anchored about 20 kilometers away from shore, it would easily take about two hours, cost more than $2,000 and produce more than 100 kilos of CO2, just that one single delivery. But with a drone, the same delivery can be uh, reduced to just two minutes, cost only about $500 and emit almost zero CO2. But the challenge is that, you know, drones, while they have the potential to change this, but they are not yet good enough, considering that marine and offshore applications require drones that can lift heavier loads over longer distances. This is why we are developing our proprietary drone, which can fly 100 kilometers with 100 kilogram loads. It would be an EV tall that takes off vertically and flies like a plane. It would be aviation great. So unlike consumer drones, it will have all the safety systems required. As a fully electric drone with zero dead weight, it will be more efficient and sustainable than any other drone, certainly in this payload range category. So this is quite a huge aircraft. It will take off vertically like a helicopter. The whole aircraft will rotate to fly forward with its fixed wings. That's how we can fly further and faster with heavier loads. And then you will land back vertically with high accuracies using computer, even on rocking vessels. Most importantly, our customers can benefit from cheaper, faster, and greener logistics. 
So you may be wondering, what can we carry you know, with 100 kilos? So on the right-hand side of this screen, these are some of, our, some of the items that our potential customers have told us that are critical to their offshore operations, like drill bits, gas tanks, sensors, um, even live rafts could be sent with our drone. And under five kilograms, we have found out that this is also a very interesting market because a high volume of these items, including bunker samples, spare parts, and documents are being sent to these vessels on a daily basis. So it's going to take us some time before we get to the big drone. So Hyperlaunch Heavy on the right of the screen will only be commercialized after 2023. It is a drone that would be about the size of a car that can deliver payloads of up to 100 kilos over 100 kilometers. And it would take about 18 to 24 months to get it certified uh, for the requisite airworthiness certifications required. So far, we've been just using an off-the-shelf drone for our drone deliveries shown on the left here, which really can do very, very little. Uh, but in between, we've actually been building model drone platforms as part of our uh, development roadmap. In fact, we will be commercializing two of these platforms, namely Hypercopter, which can be carrying five kilos over 30 kilometers, and Hyperlaunch, which is a scaled down version of the final product, and it would itself be able to carry five kilos over 50 kilometers. And we are looking to commercialize these two drones within the next three to four months. In fact, we will most likely conduct our first hypercopter deliveries to ships within the next three to four weeks. Hypercopter is a drone specifically designed for the maritime environment. It would be free from magnetic interference, which is a huge problem in operating to vessels. It would also have state-of-the-art avionics that we are putting onto our larger hyperlaunch drones. And hypercopter would also be if we were to end up in water. I mean, we never want this uh, drone to end, end up in the waters, but uh, our customers have asked for this. So that in a worst case scenario, they would still be able to track and retrieve the spare part or document, which may be the only PF uh, anywhere else. Coming on to Hyperlaunch, we've actually built uh, three Hyperlaunch aircrafts and have flown this more than 200 times autonomously. And we intend to commercialize this in three to four months, like I mentioned. So here's a quick video to show you how we have transformed an idea to something flying literally. So we are very excited about the um, hypercopter and hyperlaunch um, flying uh, to ships within the next uh, couple of months. Transforming maritime logistics to be more efficient and sustainable is uh, certainly core focus for us. But digitalizing our operations is certainly on the top of our minds as well. There are three parts that we hope to achieve ultimately, and we are open to partnerships in these areas. Firstly, in the front end, uh, which users use to book or order drone delivery and, and you know track their par parcel or cargo status. Our hope is for it to be as user-friendly as an Uber or Grab in future. Secondly, it is the AI for demand uh, supply aggregation 
to ensure that our drone assets are optimized for the most efficient and timely deliveries for our clients. And thirdly, which is what we are already working on is in digitalizing and automating the whole drone delivery process. Our drones can already hop fully autonomously over land, and it is just a matter of time before our drones can land autonomously on vessels as well. But before you know, a drone actually lands on a vessel, it needs to first find that vessel. And to this end, we have uh, integrated AIS data onto our ground control software, and our drones can automatically plot their own flight path to minimize any flying over uh, other uninvolved vessels already. In computer vision, we have also trained and demonstrated that our drones can find a helicopter marker by itself and land on it even when the marker is moved half a meter per second to simulate the environment of uh, landing on vessels. And with machine learning, we are working towards a scenario where our drones can ultimately land autonomously on any vessel without the need for any form of markers. So this is a big task. So we are open to partnerships in computer vision and machine learning as well. Lastly, one of our key challenges uh, that we are also addressing is long distance communications. In the offshore environment, we do not have 3G, 4G or 5G networks. So satellite communications would be the default option, but it is costly. So we are open to innovative solutions and partnerships which can address this need. At the initial stages, um, our drones would only require about three to four Mbps with uh, less than 200 milliseconds of uh, latency for telemetry control and live video feed for uh, the drone pilots. And the drone is, but a drone is actually designed to make decisions by itself with its uh, own computer. So it will um, transition to only requiring about 50 kb per second at steady state. So this is my last slide. I think in summary, we have key explore technology comp collaborations in uh, digitalization, computer vision, machine learning, as well as uh, offshore communications. And we're also very keen to explore opportunities for more pilot projects with Norwegian companies in Singapore and Norway. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, for the excellent presentation. Next, we will have AOS Offshore. AOS Offshore is a high-tech asset integrity management company focused on delivering oil and gas renewables and industry 4.0 goods and services to clients. It is founded by a Norwegian with operations based here in Singapore. The presenter is Mr. Peter Nelson himself, the founder and managing director of AOS Offshore. Peter, please. Thank you very much. Uh, let me see if I can start this. Uh, here we go. And hopefully everyone can now see the, the presentation. So what I'll do is uh, a little bit uh, elaborate, elaborating a little bit on what Nicholas has just uh, shared with us. Uh, I will be talking a little bit about the subsea and aerial drone capabilities. So I will do a little bit mix of what we have done and uh, current pro projects that we are working on and developing. First of all, um, we will show a little bit about how we can do air and sea simultaneously uh, operations, meaning that we can actually do subsea and aerial drones working together and also have a real-time software platform that can uh, communicate and uh, make the operators know exactly what's going on and all the rest. Uh, the subsea, heavy, uh, subsea and heavy lift aerial drones, I'll be showing a little bit on the logistics side. Uh, me, myself, come from the oil and gas industry. We work a lot with oil rigs uh, all over the region uh, and uh, most of the stuff that we're dealing in is uh, normally quite a lot more heavy than 100 kilos. And uh, as everyone knows in this business, it's always uh, uh, in urgent need. And the last thing I will do is to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, spot on software that we're using for this. So. This is a typical scenario that just to show you the capability of what we have. Uh, we can do uh, in any case of catastrophe or an inspection uh, 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 scenario, we can actually uh, multitask numerous things and uh, we can tie all this in together with all types of, uh, of uh, uh, software. Uh, it is all at the end of what the client is asking for and what is the, the, the general uh, focus on the problem and, and what we have to, to look into. 
The same thing will happen also for the aerial surveillance capability. And there is uh, the drones that we will show you a little bit later is, of course, uh, there is basically today no limit on what type of sensors can be put in uh, to these uh, uh, drones. One of the things that we have been doing is uh, subsea drones for inspections. Uh, this is a project that we've been doing uh, together with a client here in Singapore. Uh, we were tasked to come up with a solution uh, to come up with a 100% diverless inspection. And the reason happening, no, the reason being is that they had an, a, a fatal accident some years back. From the first meeting until we delivered a full scale pilot test, it took us six months. And uh, we have now done only for this client 1,800 piles that we have inspected according to the API standards for, uh, for uh, offshore terminals. Uh, and uh, we have met all the criteria. So what you see down on the left hand side is probably the smallest subsea pulsed eddy current uh, uh, system in the world that uh, allows you to do a reading of corrosion thickness, but you don't have to clean the asset before you do that. Uh, and the last part that you can see on the side here is uh, a inspection either under hull or we are doing inside tanks. Um, next thing I would like to draw your attention to is the unlimited movement and the software development that has been in this sphere. This shows you uh, some of the pool uh, testing that has been done with the, when you're using six degree of freedom uh, uh, systems. So the software will enable us to basically enter and maneuver these uh, subsea drones in, in any possible way. Now, there are two types of drones you can use, is either they are surface tethered, meaning that you get power from the surface, or you can uh, do them battery operated. Still, you will need to have a reliable system with the tether uh, and also for transmission of, uh, of a lot of um, information that we are requiring, that is required from the client. So it's high, high uh, uh, quality video, it is uh, pulse steady current, it could be uh, UT, measurements. We also do laser scaling uh, to see and, and monitor problems for our clients. These are fairly, uh, uh, um, I say, advanced operations, and but we're using a common and off-the-shelf technology combined to, uh, with, with our various drones in order to see how we can solve it and, and, uh, and, and do it in, in, a, in a very timely and safe manner. I think safety is probably the key here. Uh, another thing that we're working on is uh, with a partnership with a company called ACC Innovations out of uh, Sweden. Uh, they are testing now the latest drones uh, that has been ongoing for quite some time, almost a couple of years. Uh, the biggest and heaviest lifts currently being done uh, is up to 400 kilos. Uh, this will allow us to uh, deliver um, uh, all kinds of logistics uh, off to uh, various types of, uh, of uh, locations, that being on the ship spare side or logistic solution for the drilling rigs. Um, what you see here is actually a trial test for one of the world's uh, largest windmill manufacturers. Uh, we are testing and simulating a robot tool that is gonna be lifted up for doing cleaning of the windmill blades as the, it is a huge part of the service being done to these during operation. So, and it's, uh, it's, it's quite an interesting uh, uh, challenge that we've been through here and also all the different type of flying that has been done. A little bit on, I know I'm aware of we are under 10 minutes, so I'm just trying to push through here. Um, Another thing that we're currently working on is uh, firefighting drones. Uh, this particular drone here is the similar model, but can be now lifting up to about 1,200 kilos. These drones will be uh, fitted with, uh, with the different types of, uh, of uh, systems to uh, basically autonomous or manual go and get water to any nearby location and then drop the water over the, uh, the fire that might be uh, uh, being a building, being a vessel, being the various uh, uh, problems that you will be looking into. The, uh, the system that you see here has been doing a lot of extensive testing. 
There are different models uh, that are being done, uh, but we're trying to use the similar known industry grades of, uh, of uh, equipment. So it's, uh, uh, as we speak now, there has been, well, hundreds of flights been done. Uh, and uh, it is a part of also the certification of these drones. Uh, we are doing a two-way certification. One is for um, the international EASA certification side, and the other one will be one that will be moving into operating in the wind farms. Um, as was mentioned earlier today, um, you are actually creating a little bit uh, uh, the road as you go. So some of the things that we are dealing with there is no, uh, or sometimes there is not even uh, uh, the right regulations for us to discuss. Uh, and we have to then discuss with our clients and, and possible uh, solutions and see what we need to, to, to certify them against. And the last part is just to show you on the spot on uh, software. Um, we are using them both uh, for flying and for uh, subsea side. Uh, we have just uh, put in a couple of things in here in terms of what we have done uh, in the region. This one is uh, down on the left here is a, uh, is a mooring dolphin for a client. So that is a combination of a, a photogrammetry uh, and scaling, making a 3D model. And the other thing uh, that you will see on the left hand, right hand side is a, a 3D uh, sonar model that has been done of a damaged mooring dolphin uh, in Singapore. Uh, this particular uh, last uh, 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 mooring dolphin that we were involved in was, uh, had such poor visibility in the water that we had to use a combination of video footage and a 3D multi-beam sonar to create the, uh, the, the actual uh, uh, model. And uh, there is uh, no limits for us to collect the data and overlay this onto the map and the drawings or charts. Uh, it's, uh, it's merely about what the client would like to have. Um, and we try to use a lot of the uh, technology that has been used both subsea and so on in, uh, in the uh, oil and gas uh, uh, business. So I think that is, uh, that's all for me for then, for now. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that uh, exciting presentation and the possibilities on the uh, various uh, subsea and, and uh, aerial drones. We will now have Maritime Robotics. Maritime Robotics from Norway is one of the internationally pioneering companies within unmanned surface vessels, USVs, and has delivered more than 60 unmanned boats to international customers within Maritime Data Acquisition. Based on their core technology within Maritime Control Systems, Maritime Robotics is now scaling their technologies into new business areas. Here to present is Mr. Vegard Hostin, CEO of Maritime Robotics. Vegard, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I see that I have some... Um, uh, let's see here if I... <laughs> Looks a little bit strange on the... On the, on the video setting here, but okay, I'm, I'm, I'm coming out of the blue. <laughs> Let's see if we can do it. There we go. I think it's better. Yes. Um, can you bring up my presentation or should I um, do it myself? There we go. Thank you very much. So I'm um, going to... Thank you very much for being invited. Uh, it's a pleasure to to be uh, be in this seminar. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm uh, Vega Evin Hosen. Uh, I founded uh, Maritime Robotics in 2005. Uh, I have a background from um, control engineering uh, in in Trondheim, uh, Norway, and has been uh, working with unmanned systems for the last more than 20 years, actually. Um, Yes, so um, my presentation is uh, to show you a little bit about what we are doing in uh, terms of unmanned surface vehicles, unmanned boats, if you wish, uh, as mainly cost-effective solutions for maritime data acquisition, which is our main market of today. But I'm also going to show you a pot couple of potential uh, uh, business developments that we're working in within transportation. 
So next slide, please. So we were established, as I said, in 2005. We have um, two main locations set up in Trondheim, which is our main um, headquarter. And we also have a setup around in and around Oslo. Uh, we are now working mainly into the geospatial mapping markets, mapping, if you wish, surveying uh, and environmental monitoring, defense security, uh, and we also, as I said, working within transportation. We have about 5 million euro in uh, turnover last year, and we are seeing growth of approximately 20 to 30% have had and will have for the next year also. We are in these days passing uh, uh, 40 employees. We are 35 plus at, at the moment I wrote this slide. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, historically distributed over aerial products, but I'm gonna talk now mostly on the surface uh, segments we have. So next slide. So we started now uh, our first prototypes sailing in 2007 on the Trondheim Fjord. Uh, and this was well before you may have heard about the Trondheim being the, uh, and the fjord outside here being the first official test area for autonomous ships. That's correct, but it has been a lot of robotic testing here uh, well before that. So this is from 2007. Uh, it was a boat sailed around very fast actually, uh, without any real purpose except sailing around. So the real challenge for us has been to find what should we use the technology for? and how to commercialize it. So next slide. So our um, Mariner platform, which you saw the first prototype over here, is laid and now developed into a very capable product in which we have a product line. We produce uh, approximately one Mariner per quarter, as of now, uh, and mainly selling it to uh, Update acquisition needs. It will also be a very big platform, we think, for potential uh, users within transportation. Next slide, please. Yeah, and the mariner is controlled then by, uh, from a weaker control station, uh, a sh shore-based or mother shape, ship-based um, uh, position for the user is. So this is our, um, Otter product, our, our newest product actually in the USV segment, uh, but there has been a, 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 a really a commercial hit. Uh, I think we are one of the most selling USV providers now in the world of, of this, and uh, also actually to Asia, Singapore, uh, Japan, Indonesia, Indonesia, relevant for uh, for your for your region. This is the typical environment on where the otter operates best. It's a sheltered water robot of about two meter uh, with a lot of payload options. So it's really the payload that matters here or the data acquisition sensors that matters. So main purpose of this one is then seabed mapping uh, or bathymetry if you wish. Um, so next slide, we can have, um, let make, for example, this kind of topographic seabed map. Uh, this is a, 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 a dam, a hydro dam, um, very fast. And we have had now very large, we have about 50, 60 of these now uh, distributed around the world and, and very satisfied customer, mainly because we are integrating the sensors so well into uh, our software. So the user experience is is is, uh, is efficient. Among profile users, we have a lot of survey uh, geospatial data acquisition companies, 
uh, but we also have uh, such as Royal Navy and U.S. Navy uh, on our uh, on our reference list uh, as of now. So this is uh, a very strong uh, market for us right now. Next slide, please. For um, more harbor-oriented uh, applicants, you can also see that this type of maps is something we can cre create with such a small unmanned surface vehicle. So this is uh, where the underwater sonar makes the the colored <laughs> uh, segments of this picture you see here. And we also attach a light laser scanner, a LiDAR if you wish, uh, on top of the, of the boat. And you can also then scan and make topographic XYZ uh, maps of, the, of the, what's above the sea level. Next slide. So we're, yeah, this should, uh, this is a, again the Mariner, which we briefly spoke about. I think we don't have time for this video now. It's from Spitsbergen, uh, also another example of data acquisition. We can go to the next slide. Next, yeah. So, um, for data acquisition segments, we have delivered more than 60 USVs to customers worldwide. Um, uh, we have two different product platforms, um, one for sheltered waters and coastal open waters. What I would say specifically for um, the smaller version is that we are seeing now increased attention, as I said, from navies, security relevant uh, operators that are especially using this for harbor clearance and uh, harbor security. So they want to check, uh, for example, the harbor or the, uh, what, what, what can be on, uh, on the seabed before uh, maybe an important ship comes uh, to shore. Yeah, so next slide. Yeah, good references. Um, Royal Navy, as I said. Uh, uh, yeah, next slide. Our, and you can press play, there you go. Um, our core technology uh, as technology company is really the onboard autonomy systems. Um, so we have become uh, good also at building the boats itself or the robots, because this is becoming a data acquisition robots, but the main core is control engineering, navigation systems, software engineering. Um, so uh, as we move now on when this, uh, which I would to some extent see has been a little bit hype of autonomous, uh, autonomous systems, it's important for us to focus on our core technology and actually provide and, 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 and um, um, propose that to potentially the, all the boat builders and all the shipbuilders in the world, because we are, we believe, within uh, a few of the best uh, companies within maritime autonomy systems. So this will be a strategy change for us. Where we will be uh, next slide. Uh, we can um, propose then um, our um, next slide, please. Our a stamp or a sticker, if you wish, on on any boat uh, where you, it says autonomous by maritime robotics. I compare it to computers which have Intel inside. Um, so this will be an important focus for us now, strategically. Next slide, please. So being in Singapore, I also had the pleasure of being there for, from, uh, for, for before the pandemic. Uh, and um, one day I was uh, also looking at a little bit of the Armada of fleets and I thought how many of these fleets are into data acquisition uh, and how many are into transportation. And the, and the answer or the, stat or the percentage is pretty obvious in favor of transportation. So I think it's important for us to scale our technology, our core technology now into the segment of transportation, keeping of course the important market into data acquisition well fed. Next slide. So in that respect, data acquisition, we're gonna continue with our turnkey integrated data acquisition robots, but we're gonna move also into transportation in a more autonomy onboard uh, uh, way. 
Okay, next slide. So we were um, on a on, little bit on the headlines a few years back when we launched um, um, a conceptual uh, study um, with Rocketeen in Japan about a small uh, uh, last mile, you can call it, or not necessarily last mile, but a short, sh uh, sh uh, short passage uh, sea freighter designed around two uh, standard containers. Um, we almost got there, but then uh, Rakuten decided to, to build out a 5G, 5G network uh, in, in, in Japan and, and cancelled it for priority reason. Uh, but, but the momentum was, was uh, clearly interesting. And um, we have moved on a little bit since then. Next slide, please. Um, so we have also, of course, seen that the current Mariner we have has uh, about one uh, metric or um, one cubic meter of volume and also about one ton lifting capacity. We think it's an initial, as an initial um, application tester would be very interesting for the market to utilize this proven platform into applications within transportation. Okay, next slide. Uh, we are also now actually for a customer with delivery in Q1 22, uh, delivering or uh, designing and building a larger nine meter USV, which will also be even more aimed at possible uh, usage within transportation, as you can see indicated here. Next slide. We have also, we are involved in, um, I would call it business development uh, against autonomous um, uh, passenger transportation. This is a vision. <laughs> Uh, the sh ship design made by Ulstein. Uh, our role will again be autonomy on board of these kind of uh, vessels. Um, next slide. To help us kind of carry these business development activities, we are involved in a project in a city in uh, in uh, Trone, uh, in uh, Norway called Kristiansund, which has a strait where they have an existing ferry today, small ferry. And they will now build, next, next slide, a new um, electric uh, passenger ferry, which will have certain elements of, uh, you can say it's going to be more autonomous. It will be automatic, but it will also be uh, certain autonomous function and autonomy ready. So in this way, we also see that we can partner up with uh, different uh, boat designers, different boat builders to prove our core technology inside, maritime robotics inside. Okay, I think maybe that was my last slide. Next slide, yeah. So uh, thank you very much for your, um, for your time and uh, it was a pleasure. I hope to see you in Singapore uh, when, uh, when the world is getting more back to normal, hopefully maybe next spring. So uh, in, uh, in the uh, maritime days there. So until then, see you next time and uh, have a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Vega. Uh, we will now have Super Radio. Super Radio is from Norway. They are a marine time 5G pioneer for ocean digitalization and autonomous ship. They are revolutionizing and optimizing wireless connectivity in the ocean, and their solutions can provide stable 200 megabits per second connections up to 70 kilometers from coastline. Here to present is Mr. Kun Yang, CEO of Super Radio. Kun, please. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, let's share my uh, screens. Hello, is everyone can hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. So, uh, thank you for the introduction and um, uh, thank you for, for your time. So, uh, my name is Quinn Yang. I'm the founder of Super Radio AS. 
So today I'm going to introdu uh, introduce, introduce our uh, work on the marine technology solution. So Oops. Uh, Kunyang, can you uh, share your slides again? Yeah, I have done that. Is that okay now? Uh, I think it's coming up. Yep, now it's fine. Yep, please go okay. ahead. Okay, sorry. sorry for attacking the uh, problem. Uh, a short introduction about myself. So, um, I, I got my PhD from Norwegian University of Science and Technology, uh, 10 years plus on the land based modern time. Communication uh, experience. So, I'm leading the world's first modern time 5G project funded by the Norwegian Research Council called Mami Mai. And also, we got uh, Seal of Excellence from Horizon 2020 uh, SME Instruments Phase 1, uh, participated in several Norwegian and European uh, national projects. And I was invited uh, as a speaker at the 5G World Summit and Asian Pacific Modern Time to talk about the, the 5G forward modern time vertical. Uh, a short introduction about Super Radio. So we were founded in 2014, based in Oslo. Uh, and in 2016, we started to lead in the world's first modern time 5G project, uh, 14 million Norwegian kroner. Uh, and in 2017, we were so we have developed a proposed uh, dedicated modern time 5G Muffin MIMO solution, and we got the grants from uh, Innovation Norway. And in the 2018, uh, together with Tanya and Kongsberg, we have uh, conducted the field test with a Tulumos ship and pre-5G LT uh, solution. Uh, in the 2016, we built a, a prototype for the user terminal, which you can put it on the ship and the maritime infrastructures. Uh, and then we have um, uh, build up MOU for pre 5G field tests with a small version Yara Parkland, the world's first uh, electric driven uh, autonomous ship, and also get a uh, safe accent from European uh, Commission. Uh, in 2020, we build a more collaboration with ISP and start working on the standardization with 3GPP work. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the heat map, the global heat map. So it can be found that the, the, the most of the, the maritime activities and shipping routes are close to the coastal line. And that makes um, our land-based uh, maritime 5G solution uh, uh, very important because that is the, the, the market, the potential market is huge. It's possible to be covered by a land-based solution if we uh, do more work on the um, uh, to improve the coverage and system performance. So that's why we, we work on that a lot. Uh, I have emphasized a lot. The 5G that we're talking and we are using for the land is not what we are working on for the maritime 5G. So let's take a look at the conventional 5G. So they are originally designed for land radio propagation environments which include a lot of scatter, reflectors, and, and then that can be uh, and create a lot of reflection about the path for the radio wave, which is good for the current 5G solution. But if you take a look at the, the marine time radio propagation environment, it's obviously different from the land scenarios, because basically you have line sites and reflection of the, the sea surface. So, which means if you use the, the conventional 5G arena design for land radio propagation environment for ocean, you will have a lot of problem. Uh, and that's why we working on, we emphasize that 5G is not a maritime 5G. And that's a big difference. Uh, a short introduction about our uh, Mami Mai project. So that title is called LTE Wi-Fi 5G Muslim MIMO Communication. 
in a marine time radio fabrication uh, environment. So Super Radio is a project owner and a professor for the academy in the Norwegian University of Science and Technology as a project manager. So together we are working with uh, NTNU, with Sintef, Kongsberg, Tania, uh, Teddy Plan, uh, White Outcome, uh, University of Southern California, Agro University, uh, KU Leuven, and so on. So basically in the project objective is first, the phase one is to optimize the current LTE and the Wi-Fi system for the marine time applications. And the phase two is to research the dedicated 5G massive MIMO solution. So let's take a look at the conventional 5G. Uh, so the, 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 mouth, the conventional 5G use massive MIMO solution. And in the, in the environment, you can see you have a lot of reflections and scattering, you create a multipath and you utilize the multipath, uh, the multi-radio path to improve the system performance. And the coverage up to 30 kilometers, and it's not very stable for, um, for the modern time applications. But let's move to open sea environment. So we have pure line of sight and reflections. So it's very difficult to create a multipath to, 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 to improve the system performance as we expected. And then uh, based on our uh, many years of research uh, on the radio propagation oversee, we have proposed the, massive, the, the marine time 5G solution. So that's the, on the on right hand side the photo, that's the structures that we have built up the, the massive MIMO solution to create the multipath even under the line of sight solution uh, uh, scenarios. And on the, on the right hand and left hand side, the figure is, is the PLC, the proof of concept that we got in the Kronheim field uh, measurement data. So if you take a look at the uh, dark blue curve, that's the solution that we have. And under the same uh, communication conditions, the light blue curve is conventional Massive MIMO solution, which has been neutralized for 5G base station. So it can be found that it's very clearly that under the same communication condition, we have 10 to 20 dB extra. That means we have 10 to 100 times better on single strands, which can be used to increase the coverage and increase the stability and throughput. So that's why we are very confident that the coverage can up to 50 to 70 kilometers with high stability and up to 200 megabit per second data. The, the 200 megabit per second data is what we have uh, tested in Oslo Fjord, which I'll we'll show later. So the, our product will be two parts. And the first part is the dedicated massive MIMO solution, which has been used for the base station site. So that's on the uh, left hand side. It will be, uh, it will provide higher reliability and longer coverage and throughput. And that is the TRL, TRL five to six. And on the right hand side is the terminal side, which uh, terminal product, which puts uh, ships and the infrastructure, modern time infrastructure. And that has been uh, our industrialization procedure. Uh, here is, is our uh, video about how we do the research for the Mami Mai project. So this is uh, the antenna system that we built up and tested in the Norwegian University of Science and Technology Lab. And we put the, the antenna system uh, along the, the Kronheim coastline and we use the, the autonomous ship provided by the Kongsberg. So that's the, the, uh, the inside of the autonomous ship. So we build up different scenarios to test the radio, radio waves, the, the system performance, and we use a very uh, high resolution radio measurement equipment. 
and that's on the board uh, what we have, and we do a lot of new tests, and and that has been the data has been used to prove our concept. It works. Uh, it is it is surprising for us as well, and that's world's first and our time massive mobile channel measurement campaign. It's a tool model. And then the, the second video is uh, what we have testing in the Austin field with our pre 5G uh, user terminal. So we put the terminal on the sailboat. This is the environment in the Austin field. So this is where we are. So firstly, we we turn on the 4G network. I say data is up and down, not very stably. And data rate is 18 megabit per second. Uh, right after we turn off the 4G and turn on our pre 5G solution, you see the data is very, the signal is very stable and data rate is 111 megabit per second. So we have a uh, uh, great improvement on both stability and data rate. So basically, what we want to do is we, we want to use our um, solution on the for the maritime. 5G solution to, to, to provide connectivity for the ships, for the infrastructures like oil, gas, oil system, uh, agriculture, autonomous ship, and, and use connectivity to transfer data to the cloud and AI system. And in addition, to provide real time uh, communication applications like video monitoring, body boy, boy system monitoring. Uh, old communication, environment, the same thing, and remote control, and so on. So that's pretty much uh, what we have done uh, and we, what, we, what we want to do. So thank you for your time. Uh, and that's pretty much my presentation. Thank you, Kun. Uh, we shall now have Kongsberg No Control. Kongsberg Nord Control is a key player in maritime vessel traffic management system from Norway, and they have also a strong presence in Singapore. They are working closely with both the MPA and the Norwegian Coastal Administration. He can, uh, they can also share more uh, with us on the exciting new developments using VDES. The presenter is Mr. Bjorn Koster, Managing Director of Kongsberg Nord Control. Bjorn, please. Uh, thank you. Uh... Daniel, uh, yeah, I hope you can hear me now, yeah. Thank you, Daniel, uh, for the introduction, and uh, let me share my screen. Um, or if you could bring up my presentation, maybe uh, it could be easier. Yeah, as... Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so um, the topic I'm going to uh, to introduce a bit more today is uh, is e navigation maritime services uh, using um, both uh, potentially VDES and potentially 5G. I'm saying potentially because these these services are still in uh, in the development phase and uh, and and the trial phase. Uh, uh, so um, these topics were already introduced by uh, by Captain Arik and, uh, and Mr. Thomas Ting earlier today. So I'll uh, I'll follow up on some of the parts they uh, they already have have introduced. So next slide, please. Um, so uh, three main topics I would like to highlight: it's uh, the maritime services in the context of of e navigation uh, from a VTS perspective, I would say, so vessel traffic services perspective. Uh, really, uh, main focus is maritime uh, safety uh, and to certain level uh, uh, efficiency as well. Uh, we do have uh, several technology enablers, I would call them. Uh, like today, you already have uh, radio communication. Uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, for some, maybe uh, most of the uh, of, uh, data communication or communication between ship and shore is done by a voice. Uh, so we have a, a, a use case to, uh, to reduce the amount of voice communication within the, within the VHF maritime communication band. Uh, 
Uh, we also already today have AIS, which uh, pr really provides a position on all the vessels in, in the area, as you all probably know very well. It also has an uh, application uh, service message uh, part of it, which where you can send text messages, you can provide virtual atons and uh, and so on. But this is highly congested at the moment, and uh, and uh, therefore VDES is the next step of AIS. Uh, that's how we would like to see it. Uh, there you have uh, more possibilities to to uh, explore these, these type of services. Uh, and also as our previous speaker uh, nicely introduced the 5G for maritime, um, this is really something which could be a game changer as well for the VTS service providers. Uh, we do have many uh, services which uh, uh, are are uh, struggling within the current voice AIS environment and to some extent uh, VDES will support but uh, uh, so, some uh, some services will require more brand bandwidth which I'll get back to and then uh, really the 5G or or even 4G in a mar maritime uh, environment uh, would be really really good but the problem there is as, uh, as our previous speaker also said it's the coverage and uh, uh, really good to see that there are solutions coming within this, this area. And finally, we have some use cases I will, uh, I will shortly introduce. We have our Sesame Solution 2 project and uh, the MPA Next Generation Vessel Traffic Management System. Okay, next slide, please. So, uh, e-navigation, as already defined, uh, I won't dwell much on it, but it's, it's really covering a, a large area uh, of uh, digitalization towards the maritime industry and uh, it's by electronic means uh, uh, exchange and uh, presentation of maritime information so uh, from our perspective uh, we provide uh, vessel traffic services systems giving uh, the shore side uh, uh, situational awareness uh, so the question is really how can we share this situational awareness with the vessels to make them take better decisions on uh, uh, navigation uh, navigation decisions and get a higher level of maritime safety. Uh, next one. So we have uh, uh, focused or we are focusing on three different service uh, types as defined by IMO. Uh, the first one is a VTS information service where we focus mainly on navigational situations and warnings but also metro metrology and hydrography information as well as uh, electronic navigational aids. Next one. We have a maritime safety information services where uh, sharing on navigation warning areas, for example, is, is a key thing, uh, but also sharing of uh, meteorological warnings and forecasts. Next one. And vessel shore reporting service. This is uh, maybe one of the first uh, maritime services within the navigation platform which will, will uh, be provided. It, uh, you have two different type of reportings. So you have a pre-arrival uh, reporting uh, and you have a, a ship reporting system which is defined for certain special cautious area like uh, the straight rep in Singapore where all, all vessels coming uh, or all vessels which are are subject to this mandatory reporting how to provide certain uh, information uh, when they're entering Singaporean waters. The same uh, you have in Norway with a bar rep and uh, or in the English Channel where you have the Kaldov rep. Uh, so these are very standardized reporting uh, systems. Okay, next one. So these three areas will be uh, focused for, for our further development and uh, is already being uh, being developed, but uh, will uh, further enhance these, uh, these in the coming years. Okay, next slide. So uh, we have uh, during the day already heard a bit on uh, VHF data exchange system, that's a VDES. So uh, you do have both uh, terrestrial uh, VDES stations and Kongsberg provides both uh, mobile uh, station on board a vessel, which can uh, replace the existing AIS uh, unit, as well as the base station on uh, on land, where which would replace the existing AIS base stations. So uh, that's one level of, uh, of the VDES, where you get uh, coverage, as you do today with VHF voice communication. Um, but 
to really uh, uh, explore the possibilities of, of VDES, you, we also have a satellite VDES uh, coming up, which uh, the panel discussion also today uh, introduced nicely. And uh, Kongsberg has uh, participated in this effort. Uh, and uh, we hope to see more of these satellites coming up so we get a more extensive coverage of course and, uh, and hopefully this, that will uh, come during the coming years uh, it has to come uh, and uh, as one of the speakers said it's uh, first we need the, uh, the communication infrastructure in place and then we will uh, provide services uh, which can utilize this uh, this technology um, so next one Next one will be an introduction uh, of some uh, demonstrations and tests which have been done. I won't go into detail of all of these, but there has been uh, one with a Coast Guard vessel using VIDA satellite uh, already in 2019-2020 in collaboration with, uh, with the Norwegian Coastal Administration. Uh, we have done uh, uh, the SUSIMS 2, uh, where we have exchanged route information between uh, ship and shore. We have uh, the VASP project. Uh, we have a Sesame 2 project, which I'll, uh, which will come a video in a, in a second. So I'll leave that. And you also have the R mode, which is um, uh, maybe uh, new to some, but it's uh, it's part of the VDES infrastructure where ships can get their position from uh, from a shore base, the VDES station, instead of getting it from their own navigation system. Uh, which could be very useful in critical situations where uh, where you for some reason not uh, not get your uh, your position okay next one so this is an introduction on our sesame solution 2 project um, i don't hear any sound i i would assume you you don't hear either but um, it's basically a, presenting uh, e-navigation uh, voyage into Singapore port. So the idea is that the vessel early on in the voyage will be able to report uh, via satellite VDES uh, to uh, to Singapore VTS and in, in that way uh, get a better planned voyage uh, as well as a more safer journey because of uh, uh, the journey being surveyed by, uh, by VTS. Okay, we'll uh, jump to the next one. And the next one. So introducing the MPA Living Lab, next generation vessel traffic management system. Um, this is uh, an innovation lab with, where we have worked together with uh, MPA and our partner Singapore Technologies. Uh, for the last three years, uh, developing a new functionality for the next generation system. In 2019, uh, MPA arranged an Ayala workshop uh, where we demonstrated uh, uh, at least two of these uh, services I've been uh, been talking about, the information service. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see um, a close quarter situation, which was shared between shore and ship. Uh, and uh, on the lower right hand side you can see the maritime safety information where we share the navigation area navigation warning areas between uh, ship and shore uh, also within this project uh, singapore technologies has developed their uh, vides uh, ship prototype and uh, we plan uh, to finish up the project in uh, next year after pandemic allows it, <laughs> I would say, to to do a final test with MPA, ST and us on uh, using VDES ship shore communication with the Kongsbury base station and the ST ship station. So that is really showing a collaboration between Singapore and Norway on uh, on the VDES side and uh, hopefully we can do more, more of this in the coming years, uh, especially within the satellite as well. So next slide. The final one with some findings and summary. So uh, there is still a need to uh, standardize the VDES protocol to really get a major rollout. But the technology is coming along, and uh, and hopefully we can get this standardization in place soon. 
Uh, and the following navigation services seem to be the most suitable for Revidas. It's really about voyage reporting and, uh, and basic information services such as welcome message or, or reporting links uh, and uh, what services a vessel could have. For example, if a service comes to Singapore, it can, can get the message on on uh, that you have these certain e-navigation services available and then you can click on them and utilize uh, or maybe 4G, 5G uh, systems in the future. So main challenges with VDAS is, uh, is as, as you know, it's a bandwidth which is limited, so it limits the service capabilities. Hopefully 4G, 5G will, uh, will be a fundamental change and make, uh, make uh, new services available and uh, uh, so yeah, uh, to, to, uh, finally, uh, it's really about standardizing uh, these services and uh, and the protocols used so we can use existing equipment on, on board, board the vessels. Thank you very much for uh, for the time for this short introduction to our services and uh, hopefully we have some questions as well then. Uh, thank you, Bjorn. We shall now bring uh, all the presenters, uh, presenters back to address some of the questions from the audience. Uh, okay, we, we'll start with a question for Vegard uh, from uh, Maritime Robotics. Uh, there was a question from Andy about uh, whether can a MBES be mounted on your USV? I think M MBES uh, refers to multi-beam echo sounder, sonar to uh, map the water bottom. Yes, definitely. That's what we do all uh, all day, <laughs> in a way. Uh, so that's our main market, and we have now uh, we have a long list actually of, of successful integration delivered to customers. From uh, the, the majority, probably lies within the three major players on shallow water multi-beam echo sounders, which is Kongsberg, uh, Teledyne, and uh, and and Norbit. Um, so uh, and we all, but we also have other multi-beams uh, well integrated and delivered out to customers. So uh, please contact us about that. <laughs> yep, you can contact us. Uh, contact uh, Innovation Norway. We will tie you up with him. Um, uh, Nicholas, uh, there's a question from uh, Natajan. Uh, what is the max load your, uh, I believe, drones can take? And is authorization available for delivering the package in transit? Um, so the maximum payload um, for drone deliveries that uh, we are developing is uh, working towards something that can carry 100 kilos over 100 kilometers ultimately. Um, but in uh, the next uh, two to three weeks when our uh, proprietary drone flies, it would be able to carry 10 kilos over 15 kilometers. Um, with regards to the second part of the question, I didn't quite get that, but I suppose it, it's uh, asking if we could send um, items to OPL. Um, that is some, certainly something that we are looking to um, work towards because uh, OPL deliveries uh, tend to be uh, very time consuming, uh, potentially five, six hours for a single delivery. And uh, that's something that a drone can do in under half an hour. Yeah, thank, thanks for the answers. Uh, and we have a question to Kun uh, from Jeff um, that the uh, understand that 5G is more for near shore application. Uh, how does this compare with Triton? Uh, I believe Triton is a, another marine time wireless solution. I'm not sure if you um, uh, know this, but uh, whether you can uh, give a reply on this. Well, that's, that's a problem from my side as well. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty not sure what is Triton working for. So it's hard for me to understand this. Yeah, so I think what, what can be done is maybe after after this uh, semi seminar, you, we could uh, you know arrange for you to um, give your response to um, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, finally, I have a, a question for Bjorn. Um, which is uh, what would a ship owner or shipping company have to invest in in order to prepare for e-navigation services? I, I guess that's, a, that's a really the main question from, from uh, ship owners and uh, they don't want to invest in much things, but it's uh, for VDAS, it's really to replace the existing AIS on board with, with a VDAS uh, unit, which would be the same type of unit uh, physically. Uh, it's a new investment, but uh, it's uh, it is required to uh, to improve the communication part of it. Yep. 
Um, at, at this stage, I think we have run out of time for this uh, session. Uh, thank you for all your questions. And if there's any interest to connect with any of these companies, please feel free to contact uh, Innovation Norway after the conference. With that, um, thank you very much uh, uh, for, for your sharing. We shall now have a 